fishing has survived off the New England coast since before there were even colonies here. And what a tragedy it would be for this government to make that all go away. An industry under attack. What we do is feed America. We're not just indiscriminately braping the ocean. We're trying to feed people. Commercial fishing boats in New England going under at an alarming rate. They treat our fishermen worse than we treat certain criminals in our society. It's inexcusable. It's unconscionable. Hardworking families demonized by a multi-million dollar environmental industry whose only product to sell is fear. The only reason that all of this is in place in the first place is because the environmental industry created a massive media campaign that fisheries need 100% monitoring. Oh, but the government doesn't have the money to pay for that? That's okay, they can pay. The science is so wrong in this, and they don't want to listen to the fishermen. Nobody wants to be the guy that caught the last fish in the ocean. The consequences? The middle income person cannot afford healthy seafood. I can tell you right now, it's outrageous. Next on Michelle Malkin Investigates, we travel to the Northeast, where fishermen are drowning in regulations. I'm here at the end of the town dock, where the Stonington Fisherman's Memorial has been built. It pays tribute to more than 40 fishermen who gave their lives at sea. But there's a different death toll. The hidden number of small businesses, boats, and fishermen who've gone under because of the danger on land, a danger and a menace posed by the federal government. Michelle Mulkin investigates. Now, here's Michelle Mulkin. Fishing is as old as time. In America, our founding fathers established ground fishing as the first colonial industry. Generations of New England families have made it their tradition and their heritage to feed their fellow countrymen and provide a profitable, sustainable future for their own children and grandchildren. Today, however, these proud, hardworking fishing families and their industry are under attack and struggling to survive. When President Barack Obama took office in 2008, there were more than 5,500 permits for commercial fishing vessels in the Northeast region, which stretches from Maine to North Carolina. Eight years later, there were about 4,600. That's a loss of more than 900 boats, or 16% of the fleet. Let me show you just what that decimation looks like. Here I have 25 boats permitted before Obama. After his eight years in office, this one, and this one, and this one, and this one, all went out of business. An average of 112 per year in the Atlantic region. That's hundreds of business owners and crew members out of work. And you know why? Most couldn't survive the red tape, overregulation, and fees imposed by the government. Environmentalists and bureaucrats claim the burdensome rules and outdated regs are needed to protect the seas and address an overfishing crisis. But is that true? And does the science support their claims? We traveled to Ground Zero in the Fishing Wars to investigate. Nestled in the Northeast, straddling the border of Rhode Island and Connecticut are a series of quaint communities filled with hardworking Americans. But the charm has also attracted the attention of multimillionaires like Taylor Swift and Conan O'Brien. There's no question that they're part of the 1%, a stark contrast to the blue collar character of the region. Meet Tommy and Aaron Williams, brothers and fishermen. Aaron's crew includes his 20 year old nephew, Andrew. All three say their love for fishing came from the patriarch of the family, Tom Williams. When we bought the Heritage in 1997, I knew Tommy would end up running it. So I asked him, I said, what would you like to name the boat? And with no hesitation, he said Heritage. And I said, that's, that's really nice. 2006, we bought another boat for Aaron to run. And I said, well, I gave your brother the option of naming it. What would you like to name it? And he said, Tradition. And I think that speaks to how they feel about their business. They were both in their 20s when, when they made these decisions, so I was very impressed that they thought that much of their livelihood, not to name it, you know. The money maker, or. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> more of the wall name, you know. The boy's maternal grandfather was a fisherman, 
So Andrew is actually fourth generation. Yeah, I was just drawing the fish and it's my family's done it forever. And it's just a sense of pride to be able to go work with them, do what they did, see what they were doing. Despite their love for the job, it's becoming increasingly difficult to stay afloat. When did you start feeling that you were not able to operate your business in a friendly environment? Probably 10 to 15 years ago, the government just got involved to a ridiculous level. Decades ago, fishermen like Tom Williams welcomed regulations to stop foreign fleets from pillaging America's coastline. In 1976, Congress passed the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act, which extended U.S. control of waters from 12 nautical miles off the coast to 200. We were all pretty happy thinking that, you know, the foreign fleet was going to be removed, it would be more fish for us, and everything was going to get good. And I'll never forget, there was an old time, and he was sitting off to the side, and he was just shaking his head, and everybody said, Luke, what's the matter? He said, boys, you've seen the best of it, because the government's involved now. Mm. And boy, those words haunt me. Yeah. And he was absolutely spot on. Today, the Williams family feels strangled, not empowered by the burdensome restrictions and requirements. On a, you know, any given day when you have to go out, what you have to do to abide by the, this whole regulatory structure? We have to declare what areas we're going to be fishing in. We also have to submit a sector trip start hail uh, operator's permit number. After you get acceptance for those two and start your trip every morning by 9 a.m., you have to submit your daily catch report, what area you're in, and all the species that you caught. When does the process start that you have to file all 48 this paper? hours. I'm going to try and sail on Wednesday, um, so I'll declare for a, a, a observer today. And it's 48 hours 48 in hours. advance that he has to start Declaring. deciding what he wants to do and where he wants to go. And who are you filing this paperwork with? National Marine Fisheries Service. Okay, so these are federal bureaucrats and they're sitting in some office and you have to submit your forms two days beforehand. Weather could change, um, what you want to target could change. It's not like you can just walk down the boat and go fishing. It, it's a, the process starts at home while he's with his sons or while he's at a hockey game, he's gonna oh, send an email so I can go fishing. Aaron invited us aboard the Tradition to see the laborious process. Before we leave the dock, um, we have to tell the government what we're doing um, and what fishery we're gonna code into. Very important at whatever hour you're leaving that you make sure you hit the right button. So, because if not, you make a mistake, you've gotta come back to the dock and redeclare. This is the big brother monitor. Yes, uh, the ankle bracelet as we yes. refer to it. They're constantly, constantly watching. Oh, man. <laughs> You're on a leash. It's a tight one. Plus, there's a daily report, trip report, logbook, not to mention the data they're already sending electronically, and sometimes human monitoring both on the boat and at the dock. There's a lot of hands into you know, a minimal, a minimal amount of fish to let us keep. Right. So a lot of people know what's going on as far as, you know, what we're catching and where we're at. And, and then on top of that, when you do come in to unload in most every port we go into, there's environmental police there monitoring what we're catching. And if you're a pound over on, on a limited species, you're in violation. Most people envision a you on your fishing boat, just you alone with the seagulls <laughs> overhead, not knowing there's a whole village of bureaucrats yeah. spying on you yes. while you're trying to do your job. Yeah. And it's not like we want to take every last fish out of the ocean. You just kind of want to do your job. All of this is stressing me out. <laughs> like, don't hit the wrong button. Yeah. We got eight to 10 hours out, and you realize you sent the wrong code. Oh. So that's our beep. There's the message. So we accepted your. Uh, How generous of that. Yeah, so we're all all set to go. Permission granted. Yes, yeah, we can go to work. Yeah. <laughs> For such a proud industry that's been here since before this country was here to see what's going on right now. It's, it's frustrating, it's humiliating, degrading. I give all, all the credit in the world to these guys because I, I would not have done it. It's over the top. It, it's almost like the fish aren't what they're worried about, I think. You know, it's almost jobs at stake. Their jobs. Yes, exactly, yeah. Perpetuate a crisis to maintain your security. 
fishing is both mentally and physically demanding. Not to mention the toll these long and demanding trips can take on a family. It is certainly one of the most dangerous jobs. The Center for Public Integrity published in 2012 that more workers die in commercial fishing than any other industry. And in 2015, deaths in farming, fishing, and forestry occupations increased 10% to 284, the highest in seven years. But instead of focusing on the safety procedures, the crew spends an inordinate amount of time on paperwork, checking the time, speed, net, making sure they don't accidentally do anything wrong because the fines could put them out of business. This is an old six and a half inch bag. We While explaining the process, they put me to work. You're hired. Yeah. <laughs> it's not simple or easy to fish, and it takes an entire crew. And I should hold this like this, right? Yep. Now imagine having to do your job with a government assigned regulator literally looking over your shoulder every step of the way. Seven. Big Brother on steroids. Provided they decide to assign one to the boat, um, then we're obligated to take them. Is this a federal regulation then? Yes. And Why starting do this they... year, it's industry funded. Um, partial reimbursement by the federal government for their cost per day at sea. Do they ride with you? Yes. Live with you for a week. What are they looking for? Why do they need to be with uh, you? Discard fish, um, any, you know, juvenile fish or non-target species that come aboard the boat during the process. You have to pay for this? Mm -hmm. How much does it cost? I believe our contract is uh, somewhere between 580 and 770, um, are the numbers, per day at sea. According to the government, they ran out of money to fund the program. Mm -hmm. So they are in the process of transferring that cost onto us. They're using your equipment, your property, you're providing the information that they need. Why aren't they paying you instead of you paying them? It defies all logic in my mind. I, I don't understand how, how anybody could, could come up with that scheme, but they did. Just on its face, it sounds like you're being forced to fund regulatory spies. Yes, exactly. And, and if, if any of the data was going to something that would help us, you'd, we'd be a lot more inviting. Here's one of the monitors getting off a boat docking in Stonington. The Williams family tells us the logistics alone can be awkward. Fishing boats are only so big, and there's limited privacy already. Adding an at-sea monitor or observer can be uncomfortable. This is the, what we call the, the galley of the boat. So it's all, you know, where we live, um, where we sleep, and where we eat. And uh, with a crew of four, uh, there'd be three crew members down here occupying the three bunks, and then I sleep in the wheelhouse, so the only spot left would be right here for the observer. Right here? Sleeping here? Yes, yep. So they, your crew eats here, your observer's right here, uh, observing the crew while they're sleeping, I guess? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then they're in the cockpit recording data, observing the crew, and sometimes overextending their authority. Are observers clear that this is your place, not theirs? You would hope that they would know that. Yeah. But in one circumstance, we had one that didn't understand that. Yeah. Uh, while out helping the crew um, cleaning the nets and scrubbing the boat coming through Nantucket Sound, I noticed the course changed as I was on deck. I thought something was wrong with the autopilot. And I had come in to find the observer sitting in the chair, and she had adjusted the autopilot, thinking she was helping us because we were out on deck working. Invading your space. Pretty much, yeah. That's what they Big do. Big time, and that I'm responsible for this boat, no one else. And of course, they're tracking the catch, taking secret notes of any accidental misstep. So you pull up your catch, your fish are coming here, down the conveyor belt, and the observer is right here. What are they doing? Yeah, um, so the crew will be sorting the observers here, um, going through the discards. Mm -hmm. um, the discards will come back here, they're weighed, and then they'll also subsample um, certain species of the discard. So what does the observer do over here? Uh, the observer will measure the size mesh we were towing throughout the trip. There isn't an inch of this boat that the observer doesn't meddle in. No, not one inch. I mean, they're treating you like sex offenders or like criminals, essentially. Trying to provide a food source, an incredible food source. What is the impact of this regulatory scheme overall? It's going to hurt. Obviously, it cuts into your profit margin. 
If that it's if the spread good. happens, that's it. You're going under. Uh, I hate to I hate to say that, and I hate to think that. You can only tweak a machine to a certain point, and then that's it. it, it it's over. It's not going to work. To see guys that have fished their entire life have to sell their boat, not because they were bad fishermen or bad businessmen, <laughs> it was because of the government, Be because over-regulation. There are two types of regulators. Let's run through the differences, even though many use the terms interchangeably. First, there are the observers, who collect data on the catch, discard, and biology of the fish. They are required in all fisheries and are paid for by the government. Then there are the at-sea monitors, who police the boat on how much they catch and discard, which affects the quotas. As of this broadcast, they are only required in ground fish fisheries like yellowtail, sole, and cod. Those are the monitors the industry, like the Williams family, is going to pay for. All right, in or out. All right, you're done. Have a good ride. All right, I'm going to run out there, Dad. We'll see you down the west end now. So just how much do these at-sea monitors cost? A study estimates about $710 per day, costing the industry an estimated $2.64 million per year. What kind of impact could we see? In fiscal year 2010, roughly one-third of groundfish vessels operated with negative returns. In 2013, it was almost half. And while regulatory bodies were deciding if boat owners should take on the cost, the report predicted it could jump another 10 percent. After seeing the costs, the New England Fishery Management Council voted to suspend the at-sea monitors. Yet the federal regulatory agency pushed forward. I voted against submission of that amendment and filed a dissenting opinion with the Secretary of Commerce because I felt that it was extremely disadvantageous to small boats like the boats here in New Hampshire. It would put a regulatory burden on that was so great that only a handful of large corporate interests could survive. David Gaithel is a former member of the New England Fishery Management Council, research biologist, and boat captain. There's no possible way that small boats like mine can pay that cost and still stay in business. In 2017, at-sea monitors were required to be on 16% of groundfish trips as the payment shifts from the government to the industry. This is an unfunded mandate, and there's nothing to stop other government agencies from doing an end run on Congress to get a budget increase by passing off their regulatory costs to the regulated public. So for example, the Agriculture Department could put the cost of meat inspection on the farmers. Call it whatever you want, it's a tax. So Gaithel played his last card. He filed a lawsuit, which went up through the judicial system. Now he's calling on elected officials to help. Congress and the president will have a choice. You can have a fishing industry, or you cannot have a fishing industry. But you can't have a fishing industry that pays this much money for these people. There's really no rhyme or reason as to when regulators in their comfy air-conditioned cubicles assign the mom-and-pop boats with observers. In fact, during our interview with the Williams family, the mailman arrived. Our producer opened the door and was presented with a certified letter. And you know what was in it? You guessed it, a notice that one of the Williams boats would be taking an observer on their next week-long voyage, costing them big bucks. I believe that technology and innovation are the most powerful ways to communicate in today's world. It's always been difficult to find the facts, harder to uncover truth, cut through the bias and stay informed. Most difficult of all, holding the mainstream media accountable for spin and bias. For me, that is what CRTV changed. CRTV is part of a platform for those looking for a voice outside the mainstream, questioning the official story, asking what others are unwilling to ask, providing content that uplifts individuals and empowers people with information to take control of their own lives. 
telling stories that have never been told. CRTV is about educating, about empowering. Join the media revolution at CRTV.com. The Williams aren't the only ones strangled by arbitrary regulations on commercial fishing that do more to sustain bureaucracies than they do to save the ocean. The impact ripples all the way down the food chain and ultimately to you. An entire ecosystem of producers and consumers is affected, like wholesalers that directly rely on the local catches. That money goes to keep the company running and pay its employees. More restrictions mean fewer fish to bring to market. Then there are the New England seaboard towns that survive on tourism. And what do tourists expect? Fresh local fish. But even outside the local communities, it affects you, the consumer, and what quality of seafood you expect. Once fishermen dock, they need to offload their catch. Huh? I got the electronic log oh. That's where Mike Gambardella comes in. Gambardella Wholesale Fish, been established about 100 years ago. It's a family business. Started with my grandfather and my father, and of course myself and my nephews on, on the next generation if we can make it through there. Describe what a wholesaler does. When the fish boats come in, we pack out all their fish, and I distribute it to wholesale outlets like the Fulton Fish Market. We pack it into these 60-pound cartons, and as quick as they come in with it, the fish are out the door and into the markets the next day. How many people do you employ total? Right now, we're about five. At one time, when things were much better before these regulations came into effect, I had 15 people on a payroll at one time. I know we end up with 30-something pounds at on the yellow tail. 37. 37 pounds on the yellow tail. And I actually was able to give them 401ks. I was able to give them health insurance 100%. And unfortunately, that's all out the window right now. Partly because the fishermen are catching fewer fish. How many is that on the jumbo? Uh, five jumbo. Five jumbo, OK. One time in our little port in Stonington, Connecticut, we were producing anywhere between 10 to 12 trailer loads a week coming out of there during the course of a seven-day week. Right now, I could honestly truthfully say I can't even put a trailer load together in a whole week. And I'm only talking the last eight, 10 years now. We're not talking a big amount. The last three have been the worst. It's not that the fish aren't in the ocean, but legally, the fishermen are limited on what they can catch. Take Aaron Williams' boat, for example. A three-person crew, one tow. And this is all they could bring all right. back. So what do we have here, Aaron? That is a scup or a porgy, yeah. as they're called. Um, currently, the Connecticut, all right. oh, there he goes. Currently, the Connecticut uh, scup limit is 100 pounds. So this here is our this whopping is 100 pounds of a scup limit for Connecticut. And in the area we're at right now where we tried, we're going to see these wherever we go. Yeah. So we're pretty much done. They could keep fishing and dock in nearby Rhode Island, which allows more scup. But the neighboring state closed fluke. So the crew would have to toss the fluke overboard in order to bring in more scup, a catch-22. As if this already doesn't make sense, the fish the government requires them to toss comes off the total quota. So you can't keep them, and they're going to be charged for them. You're raring to go, you're ready to work. <laughs> and one toe, if you, if you choose the wrong spot and there's too much fish there, you're done, which is kind of a, a crazy dilemma. Why are the limits set so low? Environmentalists will tell you it's to protect the ocean. We inquired about the apparent fishing crisis and specifically to discuss the at-sea monitors. But oddly enough, nobody would talk. We reached out to the multi-million dollar Environmental Defense Fund and Earth Justice, but no response. The estimates are that global fisheries will crash, completely crash by 2050 in little more than one generation. Hearing this, we also contacted the Pew Charitable Trusts. Their response? It is not an issue that is central to our portfolio of ocean conservation work currently. Okay, three strikes. Surely the regulatory body, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, also known as NOAA, would talk. Nope. They just provided a few bullet points with background info. 
They're probably afraid of the questions that you're going to ask, and they don't want to be put on the spot. Megan Lapp is a fisheries liaison for Sea Freeze Limited and lobbies on behalf of the industry. Most fishery quotas are set using a government fishery survey. The information that, that comes in from that is what's used in what's called a stock assessment, which is the best guess that scientists can have at how many fish are in the ocean. What's been a problem in the past is that there has not been cooperation between the government and the industry. People running the government survey vessel, they're not fishing captains. When they don't catch fish because the net and the vessel and all those respective things are not being operated properly, you have a stock assessment that shows artificially low, low numbers of fish and does not match what the fishermen see on the water. The most ideal situation is when you can have the survey done by commercial fishermen on commercial fishing boats, people that know how to operate the gear and then let the scientists do the science. It almost strikes me that they're manufacturing a crisis. Fishermen are out there all the time. They want accurate information because their livelihood depends on it. Their future livelihood depends on it. Not just what they can catch this year, but what can they catch next year. The Williams family echoed that. I certainly don't want to be the guy that sent Tommy and Aaron out and said, you know, kill everything you can. Right. It's in your own self-interest and your business's interest not yeah. to want to kill off exactly. every last fish. Because then you don't have a business. It's, right. a, it's a very, very simple equation that I don't think a lot of people take into effect. Every time we go out, we see an ocean full of fish. And all these stocks that have rebounded, so, you know, you try to rebuild the stock to 100%. We have certain stocks that are rebuilt to 250%. Wow. It's not like we want to fill the boat every time we go. Just a little bit more of this and a little bit more of that at the end of each day would make a drastic improvement to our year end. I think the big thing we have to do is bridge the gap between science and what we see. They don't see it, but we do. And, and that is happening. Finally, through co uh, collaborative research. Right. Take the scallop industry in the Northeast, for example. It was struggling in the 1990s because of regulations, specifically those based on figures later proven to have inaccurately low levels. They did their own survey and proved conclusively to the government that there were a lot more scallops than what the government was saying. Right now, the scallop industry is thriving. It took powerful men like then-Congressman Barney Frank and the late Senator Ted Kennedy to stand behind the fishermen. Here's part of a statement Frank made in 2006 reflecting on that fight. This assumption that fishing is inherently anti-environmental is deeply flawed. The last people in the world who want to see fishing so excessive that the stock is depleted are the fishermen. They basically made the government look foolish and it worked for them. I don't think it will happen again because I don't think peop certain people in high places don't want to be made to look foolish two times in a row. Since then, the fishermen haven't seen much movement at a federal level, even if it's being discussed. Here's former New Hampshire Senator Kelly Ayotte on shifting the regulatory cost of the at-sea monitors moving to the industry. So are you telling me there's no other place in this agency we can find $3.7 million court, so fishermen don't cease to exist in my community? The, the court found that we have to spend the money on other priorities before we spend it on at sea monitoring. But anywhere else in your budget, you cannot find $3.78 million to keep fishermen in place. Because otherwise, I say the Magnus Stevens Act is an absolute failure in this regard. Heather Summers is the Connecticut state senator who represents Stonington. Are we at a crisis level here? And what are you doing as a state senator about it? I think we've, we've reached the tipping point years ago. We are doing everything we can at the state level to really push the envelope to have that scream be heard at the federal level because that's where the regulations and the quotas are, are set. In here in Connecticut, you know, I'm the vice chair of the Environment Committee, and we have pushed as far as we really can working through our local um, Department of Environment and Energy. But even Congress has limited say as fishing regulations come from the Department of Commerce, which is part of the executive branch. This is exactly what the president ran on. You know, small business, third generation, small hometown that probably everyone in this borough has worked in some way connected to our fishermen, now being on the brink of extinction because of overregulation and Washington bureaucrats making decisions in a vacuum without actually coming here to Stonington, talking to the fishermen and seeing, you know, exactly what they're going through. 
The industry is doing its best to get President Donald Trump's attention. They even organized a welcome flotilla of fishing vessels when he spoke at the Coast Guard Academy graduation. Signs included, please help us, and make commercial fishing great again, a message they continue to push. The last three years have been the worst, and that's why we presented these bumper stickers that we put out for make commercial fishing great again. It went a real long way, cross country and everything. There's a lot of fishermen in trouble with restrictions. It's not just in our area here. We're going all the way to San Diego. I got response from Florida, Louisiana, all over. For the first time in years, they actually have hope. Leanne Senek is the Republican National Committee chairwoman for the state of Rhode Island and also works in commercial fishing. They feel that they have someone on their side. They feel that the Republican Party is going to fight for them and is going to try and, and make it easier for them to actually do business. Senek helped pass a resolution by the Republican National Committee supporting the Northeast commercial fishing industry. There are a whole bunch of points that the resolution points out. It's actually one of the longer resolutions that have been passed by the RNC. They try and keep it to one page, but there's so much that affected this industry. It's clear all these regulations are hurting the businesses, but also the consumers like you and me. I could go back when fish was so affordable. When fish went from 59 cents a pound selling on a retail level to 99, they thought they were going to go out of business. Now everything is 15 and 20 dollars a pound, yeah. which is insane. They shouldn't be. Tightening the screws on uh, the boats, right? Right, and the people who operate the boats, and then that has a direct impact on oh, you. Oh, absolutely. We're probably one of the last smallest ports on the East Coast, but one of the oldest ones that are really in jeopardy of closing down in Connecticut here. What do you see as the time horizon for the business if nothing is done? I'm going to give it another year. I told my nephew. Another year? Another year at the most. At the most. I don't think I'd go anywhere. I, I think I went two or three years too far already. I've been losing quite a bit of money. And that's just to keep my employees going, keep the building. I do get a lot of cooperation from the town of Stonington where we, we operate out of. I mean, they even lowered my rent down to help me out to stay there. Because it's not, it's not like it's my fault. They're not bringing enough fish in to make it work, and because the fishermen can't. A hardship also echoed by Stonington's mayor, Rob Simmons. When I was a kid, I would come down here and the boats would be two to three deep on the dock. They'd be unloading, they'd be fixing their gear, they'd be mending the nets. And now I come out and I take a look and, hey, where, where'd they go? It's empty. They're gone. Our fleet has gotten so small because of government regulations either forcing them to go to another state or just forcing them out of business altogether. So you went from a thriving fishing community, a very diverse community, to one that is, I'm not going to say completely barren, but has been essentially decimated it's by been the decimated government. It's decimated by government regulations, and that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to save this industry, these families, and the history and culture of this town. The town bought the dock 40 years ago to try to sustain the local economy. I'm a veteran of Vietnam and of the Cold War. And I'll tell you what, this fight for the fishing families of Stonington and New England is the toughest fight I've ever been in. As commercial fishing suffers, the weekenders roll in. So these working class fishing families have been replaced by what's over there in the distance? Condominiums. That condo over there used to be the Palmer Boatyard where they would make wooden fishing boats and you'd go in to the boatyard and you could smell the wood uh -huh. as they're making wooden boats. And these beautiful wooden boats would go out and fish closer to shore. Uh, those houses over there, one of those houses was a place where they made nets and another house was where they sold diesel fuel. Now it's all been converted to houses for summer people and vacation people. The health of the industry also affects those in hospitality, which relies on fresh fish to attract tourists. Because I can tell you firsthand, there's nothing like fresh seafood. It's a tender meat. It's not a tough meat like a gulf shrimp. And it's very delicious. Mm. Very tender. That is fantastic. <laughs> It doesn't get fresher than that. It doesn't get fresher Or than healthier. That. And it's healthy for you. It's good, healthy food. Healthy, sustainable, and renewable. Something environmentalists should be jumping towards. If the federal government regulates our fishermen out of business, then what happens to the restaurants and the tourism business? 
that declines as well because people don't want to come here to eat frozen tilapia from China or some kind of sewer shrimp from Thailand. They don't want to eat the junky food. But that junk foreign fish is all around us and can be hard to avoid. Well, to keep my business going, even during the summertime, I had to buy fish from Canada. I stay away from this chemical stuff now, don't get me wrong. I don't want to be bothered with anything out of the country that got chemicals and all. I think that's a very harmful thing for anyone to eat, very harmful. The more we've regulated our own commercial fishing industry, the more we've imported from countries, and that's what's going to be on your plate. I'll tell you as a person who researches this stuff and is involved in these issues, if it was imported, I wouldn't eat it. Government data shows the U.S. imported less than half of its seafood in 1980. In 2011, 91% of seafood consumed was imported, and in 2016, it was somewhere between 85 and 95%. Just how much money are we talking about? In 2016, the U.S. imported $19.5 billion worth of seafood, which is up 3.5% from the year before. Do note that some of that seafood is caught off our shores, but exported overseas for cheaper processing and then re-imported. That's a lot of money that could be part of the American economy. When you reduce the domestic supply, the market gets flooded with the foreign imports. Every American should be able to afford healthy, wild-caught U.S. seafood. It should not be a strain on your finances to go and buy a piece of fish for dinner. I think most people are just in the dark because they just assume that the reason why the prices are high is that there's a shortage. <laughs> right. Now, it is an artificially created regulatory shortage. The environmental industry created a public perception problem and created a massive media campaign that fisheries need 100% monitoring and fisheries need 100% enforcement. Oh, but the government doesn't have the money to pay for that? That's okay, they can pay. And they start young. That's what Andrew said. He opened up his textbook, you know, in, in middle school or high school. And there it is, overfishing, as if it's this, you know, written in stone <laughs> the truth. Where's the history of the foreign fishing fleets that came in that then we got rid of so that we could manage it ourselves because American fishermen are responsible? And where's the story of their heroism that rebuilt the stocks that now they can't go harvest and they have to pay for observer coverage for? Where's that story? Andrew. The youngest fisherman in the Williams family says his generation has a warped perception of his industry. So I want to ask you, Andrew, because especially for young people, I mean, environmentalism, it's like almost like this religion. Yeah. It's not just, there's not enough trees, but now they're saying there's not enough fish. In the textbooks, it was overfishing and this stuff that was not true. Yeah. Were we able to speak up about it? No one's going to believe you because it's in a textbook. So they think it's whatever the textbook says is correct. Wow. So my, what my family's always told me, what I saw personally from being on the boat years prior, is just looking at a textbook and it had nothing lines starts. up. And that's how it starts. Now kids are like, oh, you're overfishing, overfishing, overfishing. And it starts them teaching it in school and they plant the seed and they start reading stuff in news articles and, and it continues. And then it's so hard to undo that if they're telling kids yeah, from, from the young the age. In school. Andrew, does this make you have reservations about pursuing this as a as a career? It makes me nervous. It's definitely at times hard to see a future in what I'm doing. I hope I can carry on what these guys started for me, and I hope there's something there for me when one day maybe I take over the boats. And like they said, the future's unclear. What would you do if you weren't fishing? That's all I ever known. I lived star when I was eight years old and never thought about doing anything else. I always wanted to carry in these guys' footsteps and I don't know what I'd do. And neither would many others in the industry who may be forced to figure it out. Well, I'm struck by how incredibly hardworking and dedicated these New England families are. Tradition, heritage, their work ethic, their commitment to their families. These are the essential elements of the American dream. And yet our federal government 
is standing in the way and obstructing them from pursuing those dreams. Many of these families are now at the end of their ropes and they're begging the White House and anyone in Washington to listen to them. They've got one plea. Please, President Trump, make commercial fishing great again. So how fresh and clean is your seafood? The next time you sit down to a seafood meal or head out to a restaurant, think about what you're eating. We want to show you the difference. Wholesaler Mike Gambardella, our friend, came up here and drove in a fresh catch? Yes, yesterday the boats came in. It's less than 24 hours old. Mm. That's a summer flounder, mm -hmm. and that's a piece of filet that came off of here. We cut up this morning for mm -hmm. you to show you. And I think you should emphasize that people should look for the red gills, no smell, smell like the ocean, mm -hmm. the clear eyes in the fish. You see the gills are nice and red. That means it's nice and fresh. And these are our red shrimp that we get out of Stonington, Connecticut, off the fishing vessel uh, Neptune. He goes into deep water. And those are all, wild. everything here is wild caught. Yeah. And the best part, chemical free. So this is just hours old. And the best part is once we unload these boats daily in Connecticut, it could be on your table as far as less than 24 hours. Clean this on. is how seafood is supposed to right. look and smell, which is right. like you said, it smells like the ocean, not Yes, no, if it's putrid. got a bad fishy smell, something is wrong, Yeah, absolutely something wrong. When it smells like the ocean, you know you got it fresh. And you should demand wild caught USA product of fish here. And that's exactly everything you hear. It's all caught in the US. So let's take a look at what most people will get in the grocery stores. Hey Matt, can you come and bring us some of these things here? Yeah. Look at the comparison. All right. Isn't that something? Okay. So, oh my goodness. Yeah. Look, so apparently this is shrimp that came from Indonesia. Right. Correct. Okay. And let's just hold right. that up for. Then you don't even know how much chemical, what's added in there. Yeah. This is definitely chemical free and it's wild caught. You don't know what you find here. Same thing with the red snapper here. Yeah. Look at but the, this. This is from Mexico. Yeah. It is from Mexico, but look at the gills all yellow, the inside of the fish. Right here, all brown. That's a really bad fish. Somebody's going to get sick with this. You know, most people, and it's would, a shame. they wouldn't know better. Yeah, I know. That's the problem. And you know why? You know, hopefully because we could educate them. It's so cheap. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah. but I guess you, you get what you pay for. What right. is this? Now that's a codfish, but uh, it's product of China. Yep. Imagine that. And we have our own codfish here. We're limited to catchies. And, and, the, and the stock assessment is so high on this, this fish there. Our government will let us catch it. People could eat this healthy fish every day. It is kind of insane when you think about the, yeah. our oceans are right. teeming with this beautiful, tasty, um, incredibly delicious right. fish. But m most people are willing to ingest. They, they don't even know no, what's been not. done when it's farm raised. Yep. And then what chemicals are in it to preserve it. Frozen and then thought out so that could be who knows when it is you i just i can't get over like oh, yeah. the phys the physical like oh, yeah. visual difference between these right. plump beautiful bright red mm -hmm. stonington shrimp right and these things we've got one last yeah. thing here right. so this is wild alaskan cod fillets right people will it's very convenient it's mm -hmm. cheap they'll get a bunch of them and until where did this come the, from? until you read this little thing right here yeah wild caught alaskan Okay, but it's uh, a product of China. What they do is they're catching the fish, send it to China. China's, what do you call it, processing it for them. But you don't know what they're putting in there on their process. And yeah. yeah, the fish looks good right here. It looks beautiful. But you don't know what they're doing in China. And the only reason why they're sending it to China is because of the cost factor. But let's bring jobs back to the United States. We could do this ourselves. We don't need China or anybody else doing our work. We're catching our own fish. This is what we should be doing. I wish we could educate them. I hope that we educate them enough to understand. I hope so. People I really, really need, need to need know to what yeah. they're putting in their bodies and their kids' Absolutely. And grandkids' Absolutely. bodies, too. Mike Gambardella, thank you so much for no, bringing up this pleasure. beautiful, fresh catch mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and uh, letting American consumers know Absolutely. what they're getting and what they should be getting. Absolutely. Thank you. My you pleasure. Bet. So, as fisheries activist Megan Lapp told me, we should stop asking why local seafood is so expensive and start asking why imported seafood is so cheap. Now the consumers know the truth on the ridiculous war on fishing. They can and should demand more and better at the market and from their government. From sea to table, we should all support that call. So I'm asking you to step up, pay attention, 
and fight for one of the nation's oldest commercial industries. In today's Social Media Minute, digging deeper into the godfather of fake news. In response to our episode on Walter Durante, the New York Times' Pulitzer Prize-winning propaganda tool for Joseph Stalin, Victor Rudd emailed me. Hello, Michelle. As the son of survivors, I've been researching this subject for 40 years, and it's worse than you think. Durante was a journalistic celebrity and a confidant of such individuals as industrialist Armand Hammer, Isadora Duncan, George Bernard Shaw, and Sinclair Lewis. His spiking the news about Stalin's starvation of Ukraine was pivotal in misshaping American public opinion. Denying the Holodomor publicly, in private discussions with William Strang, the counselor at the British Embassy in Moscow, Durante stated that, quote, Ukraine had been bled white. Durante vehemently attacked those intent on disclosing the truth, malignant propaganda, according to Durante. On December 6, 1932, Strang wrote in a confidential report of Durante's eagerness that the U.S. recognize the USSR and that he, Durante, had not yet, quote, let the great American public into the secret of the Holodomor. It was, as the late UPI correspondent Eugene Lyons wrote, part of a monstrous hoax, with Durante all along privately describing the, quote, ghastly horror in Ukraine. Durante was the only Western correspondent that Stalin allowed to accompany foreign commissar Maxim Litvinov on his trip to charm FDR, whose embrace of Stalin was complete. Quote, Litvinov is taking home a pretty fat turkey. On Christmas Day, 1933, Stalin rewarded Durante with a personal interview. You have done a good job reporting on the Soviet Union. George Orwell condemned the fog of lies and misinformation that surrounds such subjects as the Ukraine famine. Huge events like the Ukraine famine of 1933 involving the deaths of millions of people have actually escaped the attention of the majority of Russophiles. But denial, obfuscation, confusion, and derision of the truth-tellers was welcomed. It was a salve on whatever conscience that may have still existed. Victor urged us to continue digging for the truth about the Holodomor, its destruction of the social basis of Ukrainian nationalism, its cover-up, and its relevance today. Stay the course, keep the faith. We will, Victor, and we know you will do the same. Thank you. In our Crap Weasel Watch, we call out the political cheaters, government thieves, con artists, frauds, and all-around idiots making America worse. Today's Crap Weasel is George Ciccarello Marr, a radical Drexel University professor who caught our attention when he took his left-wing propaganda, venom, and bigotry from the classroom to social media. At Christmas time, the self-described communist tweeted that all he wanted for Christmas was white genocide. Predictably, he tried to pass it off as academic humor. Get it? Genocide is always a real side splitter. A few months later, the Antifa fanboy tweeted that he was trying not to vomit as people thanked a first-class passenger for giving up his seat to a uniformed soldier. Chigarello Mar is no stranger to spewing hate on social media. In 2015, he wrote, off the pigs, in a vicious anti-cop tweet that channeled the Black Panther Party. Drexel opened an investigation into Chicarello Mars' social media activity, but months later, he remained on the faculty. The oh-so-concerned administration applauded as he gushed about Antifa and Hugo Chavez in interviews with the media. This is academia today. Unapologetic agitprop, radical race warfare, and social justice stupidity Proof positive that it's way past time to pop the higher ed bubble. Today's bulldog is Bobby Schindler, the brother of Terry Schiavo. Schindler has not only fought to keep his sister's memory alive, but continues to fight for human life and dignity every day. Schindler's organization, the Terry Schiavo Life Hope Network, advocates for medically vulnerable people, like his sister Terry, 
who passed away after a judge ordered her feeding tube removed. So when the parents of baby Charlie Gard asked for help, Schindler dropped everything and went to London. Charlie was suffering from a rare disorder that causes brain damage and muscle weakness. As his condition worsened, he needed a ventilator to breathe. Government-funded doctors blocked Charlie's mom and dad from pursuing experimental treatments, saying the baby would die before his first birthday. The hospital's legal team said there was no benefit to his existence. Schindler helped Charlie's parents publicize their heart-rending ordeal and provided much-needed moral support. As Charlie's case gained notice, people from around the world, including President Trump, stood in solidarity with the family. And together, the world was heartsick when the court battle to save baby Charlie was not successful. His parents wrote, Charlie, we are so sorry that we couldn't save you. We had the chance, but we weren't allowed to give you that chance. With compassion and true leadership, Bobby Schindler fights daily to make sure everyone has that chance. Next on Michelle Mulkin Investigates. We look at the battle for American sovereignty. There are people coming across the border with intent to harm our system of government and undermine our way of life. And sanctuary cities are giving criminal aliens free reign of our streets. We don't release criminals that are wanted by other states. Why do we release people that are wanted by ICE? Had he been reported to ICE, my brother would be alive today. Our legal immigration system is crumbling. But does Washington have the will to fix it? Limits and reform on legal immigration are as important, if not more, than illegal immigration. We dive into our crippled immigration system and show you who's working against our sovereignty and who's working to reclaim it. That's next time on Michelle Malkin Investigates. On this show, we dig deeper, shatter false narratives, and get answers in the pursuit of justice. On behalf of our entire team, I'm Michelle Malkin. Thanks so much for joining us.